Welcome back everyone to the VMware Explorer 2024 coverage of theCUBE here. I'm John Furrier, your host of theCUBE with Dave Vellante, also host of the Cube podcast, also known as the Cube Pod. And we are going to spend the next hour doing a Cube Pod session analysis of the market news today, what's going on? Dave, great to see you. We'll Is this our Cube Pod for this week? <laughs> well, let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> we'll do this really working together. Yeah, but I think this is you know, important that we bring the Cube Pod kind of vibe to this stage we're on. I've seen celebrity appearance for the Cube Pod uh, here at VMware Explorer, but there's so much to talk about. The vibe here at VMware Explorer in the industry, we had our session, opening session to kick it off with Rob Streche from the Cube Research. There is so many power dynamics going on in the industry um, that we'll talk about that are, that are not just, that go well beyond Explorer. So this segment's really to look at what's going on in the news today, this past week, what's coming up. I just posted this with Matt, Matt Garman, of the new CEO of AWS, the Bill Belichick, I called them, to the Andy Jassy, Bill Parcells. Can he go on a dynasty building run? Check that out on siliconangle.com, it's on your Substack. it's on your LinkedIn. It's a, it's, it's a must read, yeah. getting inside, inside baseball on how yeah. Amazon is going to evolve over the next five years. And Matt Garman really opened up and shared a lot, there's a lot in there, the video is going to be, I'll do another story follow on, there's a whole nother thing about developers, uh, how applications are going to scale, scalable applications, what's after SaaS, we're going to talk about that here actually too, NVIDIA, as we discussed, NVIDIA earnings, CrowdStrike earnings coming up, the IPO markets are hot, private markets are hot, semis are hot, and then obviously the Fed was at Jackson Hole last week, rate impacts, also crypto, I like the crypto side hustle there, Fancy football day, all the pools are hitting, snowflake, LinkedIn. Are you in this thread. year? Are you I got in? in three pools. <laughs> I got in the cube pool this year. Christian hooked me up. So um, I missed it last year. That's fantasy football, not a pick'em league. I mean, right. two pick'em leagues and one fantasy. And then finally, Dave, your AI agentic post, um, Blue Minds this past weekend. I want to unpack that because there's so much in there to read between the lines and of course, Wall Street Journal, CNBC, talking about data constraints, and M&A. We're going to unpack all of this on this segment, so you really want to connect the dots here. The Cube Pod is going to break it down, so let's get started, Dave. But vibe here at uh, Explore. Yeah, it's a completely different Explore, like one we've never seen before. It's always, usually, as you know, about the ecosystem, and it's huge, 15, 20. I think at some years they were claiming 25,000. Um, Moscone, obviously they did, did Vegas as well, but. I mean, this is not packed. I mean, you can see it's, it's pretty sparse, but it's the tip of the pyramid. The customers that I've talked to here yeah. are all sort of investing in VCF. They're sort of what I would call the, the all-in or mostly in customers that you know, basically are running mission-critical applications on, on VMware, and so, so the vibe is completely different. Um, it's much quieter. I kind of like that in a way. It's sort of relaxed. <laughs> you know what it reminds me of, John? Remember the old, the, the SAP Sapphires? It's a sort of like a smaller version of that. Very quiet, sort of staid business. Not like big, loud keynotes and, 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 and bongo drums and people dancing and spend a lot of money on, on the glam. It's just, let's get down to business. I Remember mean, 2020, 2012, I lost my voice at VMware. They put the cube stage right at the, big, at the edge of the, high up on a stage where all the sound from the expo floor came and we were like scratching our throats. I stayed out one night till four in the morning to get the scoop on the three par HPE acquisition. Remember that? Finally got it out of the guy to reveal the source and then we broke that uh, Quattrone, Frank Quattrone story where we, he had the three par deal. He had the we, auction going with broke. Dell and, and, yeah. um, <laughs> and HP. It was fun times, that was you know, over you know, 12 years ago. Fun, fun times, now it's changed. I think you're right. This is a business and community show because there's so much risk, reward opportunity on the table of VMware right now because VMware runs in a majority of the enterprises out there, IT departments, and there are so much, there's so much built around it. Jobs, people make money from it, um, there's software developers, there's ecosystems, so whether you're just a person who has a job, if that goes away, you're out of a job, right? So there's so much at stake and it's the most watched piece of this show this year is what will happen with the ecosystem? Are people going to switch? What's the deal with the licenses? Is VCF ready? Is it truly a great platform? Can it sustain another run of durable value creation in the IT world? 
I'm telling you right now, that's all everyone's talking about. Well, it's interesting. The, I mean, there are obviously sponsors here. I mean, an example would be Red Hat, but the, 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 the ecosystem is not here in force. You normally you would see Dell, HPE, you know, NetApp has somewhat of a bigger presence here, Pure, uh, et cetera. Uh, they're not here in force like they usually are. Infinidad actually is doing some stuff tonight, I saw. They've got some you know, decent customers inside the VMware base. I actually think it's, it's perhaps a missed opportunity, John. I think some of it is this emotional backlash, um, certainly from partners, uh, that didn't make the cut. Obviously, they're not making the cut, so they're not partners. But, but the ones that did make the cut, there's real opportunities here. And here's the opportunity. You know how um, Jassy, uh, not Jassy, uh, Bezos has attributed the quote, your margin is my opportunity. Jassy told yep. you one time in your private interview with Andy, I'm not sure Jeff ever said that, but anyway. <laughs> but the, the industry gave him that because, yeah. because that's what Amazon has done. Uh, sort of like blockchain, well, crypto, we'll, we'll attack the middleman. But anyway, I, to me, it's an opportunity because Broadcom is setting a high umbrella uh, on margins and pricing. And most of these services companies, these partners, you know, they're operating on much thinner margins. I mean, even a company like Dell, it's, it's operating margins in the single digits. Uh, and so, you know, Nutanix, take Nutanix, their operating margins are virtually non-existent. And so, it's an opportunity for them to actually partner, however that partnership evolves, with Broadcom to pick up the slack that you know, Broadcom is less interested in. Broadcom wants the customers that are here, that are all in, that are durable. Now, of course, they've got some options you know, in, the, in other SKUs, but you know, if you're just sort of not a huge VMware customer or you're not all in um, and you're not profitable to Broadcom, it, by, they, by the way they measure profits, exceedingly profitable company, well then, the world's your oyster because you can pull away, you know, compete for, I should say, some of those workloads and you should compete for them, whether it's Nutanix or Red Hat yeah. or SUSE uh, or HPE, uh, Ubuntu, uh, uh, some of the open source stuff. It's all there for the taking. Take it, why not? Yeah, I mean, I think the innovation opportunity right now is critical and I think the Gen AI moment is causing so much infrastructure work that um, two years ago when Broadcom took over VMware, I'm sure they saw it on the chip side, but I don't think they realized the impact of it. Maybe they did, but it's going to be a factor in risk management for how they roll out and get that platform durable for the next generation. Strategic vision of the enterprise customers right now that we talk to, and it's coming out of our research, is if you're not moving to AI with massive security built in, with full cloud operations, you're nothing. That's why I think VCF hangs together and in my conversation with Matt Garman and the exclusive I posted this morning, you'll see him open up and he really say, look at, and I quoted, the, I compared him to Bill Belichick and Andy Jassy. I love that. Because Matt Garman was one of the original product managers for AWS. He worked hand by hand with Andy. Uh, ironically, he was at a hockey game with both Andy and Matt Garman. And I'm like, Andy's bringing Matt Garman, that's weird, he's just a sales marketing guy. Well, okay, whatever. So I've known Matt for years, right? So. He was running the defense, in a way. So EC2 is, I compared, <laughs> Belichick was the def defensive genius, as was Bill Parcells, who loved smash mouth football, and, uh, you know, and you know the history with the New York Giants. Parcells was the man. He had great lineage of great coaches that came out of his organization. Holm Holmgren, others, a bunch of other great coaches. So, you know, Jassy could be that lineage leader. I think he might have lost a few people, he's got to rein them, boomerang back in, but Garmin was his right-hand man, did EC2, their core service, that's where all their money comes from. They've been grooming him, but now, Celebsky's out, he's out, he's, he could land somewhere else. But he could have been Pete Carroll, you didn't say that out of respect, <laughs> I presume, but he could have been Pete Carroll, right? I, I, didn't, wanna, I didn't want to muck up the story, but I think, I think um, Yeah, that would have Pete confused Carroll. things, but, but think about it, yeah. right? I mean, Pete Carroll, great coach, he had to follow the, the great tuna, the big tuna, yeah. and you know, just wasn't going to happen, but then he went on to be you know, tremendous at USC and won yeah. Super Bowl at Seattle. I tell you, I was a huge fan of Adam Selesky. When he came on, I've had multiple meetings with him, we've done exclusives. Yep. The guy's great, he's a great executive. He's, not, he's, no, he's no chump, he's awesome. The timing of the market shifting and how he got brought in with the Jassy leaving was just really weird, to your point about trying to follow Bill Parcells. Carroll came in 
when the big tuna, Lars Parcells, had the blowout with Robert Kraft. So Pete Carroll was not in a position to be successful. I kind of see similarities with that with Selevsky because he could have been successful, but the way once it started shifting, it became, and then all the narrative around Gen AI, that's why in my story I put the clip onto Cincinnati because <laughs> beautiful. I think Garmin is, is kind of pulling the Belichick by saying, are you Gen AI? Onto Cincinnati, his version of that is just customer, customer, customer. So he's kind of Belichick-like in his tone. You know, all the reports, are, are you sure you're getting Gen AI right? Are you sure? And all they want to ask about is, how's Tom Brady doing? Yeah. How's Tom Brady doing? <laughs> is he going to come back? Is he going to be suspended? So Tom Brady is Gen AI. Offense. The what? defense is the infrastructure. So, Microsoft w puts a good offense out there with OpenAI, but their defense sucks because their infrastructure is not strong. And so, I think Amazon has a strong defense. So again, it's a weird NFL analogy. If you don't follow football, if you do, you'll get it. If you don't, you can look it up. But I think, you know, you and I talked on our Q-Pod last time, Amazon has an opportunity to balance the game and they got to get offense. They have to find that Tom Brady moment. Who on their organization, what application, who becomes that unsung hero, and Brady was not on the radar. He had the work to get in, but once he got in, he was good. So I think that Gen AI is the offense for these clouds, and the defense is you got to maintain the security, you need scalable systems, clustered systems, custom silicon, Amazon crushes that. They are great at that and now they're building up the Gen AI, Dave. So to me, this is why I wrote the post that way. John, 10 or 12 years ago, you and I sat down with Jerry Chen at a reInvent and asked him back then, do you think Amazon will move up the stack and start to develop applications to compete in that realm with Microsoft? And he said, I don't think so. I think they're basically their strategy is to provide the infrastructure. I mean, Amazon's essentially a hardware company, if you will, but with highly automated services around it. Um, and he said, I think they're going to enable their ecosystem to build those applications. Did you get, what's your take on Q? Did that come up in your conversation at all? Because it's a huge opportunity for Amazon. They don't really you know, compete in SaaS. I mean, you know, he did, very he, tiny. He did bring it up, it's it. in the interview, but I didn't want to go drill down on it on the story because Jassy posted. And it's a track the, from, from. Well, Jassy just posted the day before. It, that story's out there that developers going to start right, so coding. what's your take on Q as the potential to be Tom Brady? Well, I think the combination of Q and humans to build these scalable apps, I think the next Tom Brady is, you know, put some points on the board. Now, remember the defense, remember the Patriots, they had a, a good defense, but Belichick had to scheme the defense with a salary cap, and he put all his eggs in the offense. So the Patriots are known for offense. So you, to beat the Patriots, you have to score more than 45 points, because they were going to put up 45 points. Charlie Weiss, Josh McDaniel, so I think Amazon has to use Q and any lever they can to create offense. And to me, it's going to be about the new applications. I asked Garmin that and I said, what's after SaaS? And he said, scalable apps. And when you look at the hard problems, it's not website, web application to SaaS on the cloud, that's what Gen 1 was. Now it's SaaS apps to solving more, harder problems. So if you look at the supercomputing being democratized, like with NVIDIA and AWS, the next, killer app is like major biology, computation, major problem solving. You know, so I think you're going to start to see the killer apps coming around quantum and super cloud kind of capabilities. Um, and again, all that doesn't happen until this, the theme we've been discussing about the relationship between cloud and on-premise gets resolved. And I think if you look at all the action right now, even though Amazon doesn't want to talk about on-premise, it's still cloud operations, so the relationship between cloud infrastructure and on-premise is huge context to the Gen AI AI movement because all the data is on site and or in the cloud. This is, has to be resolved very rapidly, and again, all the work is being done on the data center side, and that's going to be where the action is with GPUs. But GPUs are changing, so you got, again, what I did like about the Garmin post, Dave, is that he did give me something new, and that is, is that he laid down his inference opinion. He believes that inference is huge. And to quote him on that, he said, he says, why would someone do all this training and not have inference? Yeah, like, they go hand in hand. I mean, it, Jensen said the same thing. Inference is in the application, of course, we call that on theCUBE, but 
Look, I like Matt Garman. I think he can be that Belichick. Right now, he's the defensive coordinator, taking over the head coach job of the new organization. I think he's got to bring the offense. He's got to find his Tom Brady moment, and that's Gen AI. It's very clear to me that that's the offense, and then the infrastructure is the defense. And then if they can do that, then they'll continue. So the reason I bring this up is because, as we as we all know, Amazon started the AI, the IS, you know, the modern IS and cloud trend, and of course, Google and Microsoft jumped on board and have competed. Amazon does virtually no SaaS business other than, you know, it's got a little bit of Chime and Q, does some stuff through its, its partners, certainly through the marketplace, it's got a good software you know, presence. But we've seen, and we've called it, we've reported on, written about, researched, and called into question some of Azure's numbers. I mean, everybody just takes, you know, Charles Fitz just basically takes the numbers that, that Microsoft claims for, for cloud and says, okay, that's Microsoft's cloud business. Everybody does the same thing for Google and then they take AWS's business. Well, AWS's business is, it's, it's all the infrastructure. I mean, it's almost like comparing Dell's business to someone like Oracle, right? That has a huge software business. It's not apples to oranges. So we've tried to strip out all that SaaS and we've done some you know, work to do that. Microsoft, I, I presume you saw this, revamped its reporting structure to give better visibility on cloud consumption revenue. Okay, so Microsoft had always included per user revenue in its Azure reporting for things like mobility and certain security capabilities. They're changing that, they're stripping that out and then they're bringing in, I think advertising, which is kind of apples to apples with AWS. I don't know who does more advertising, that was kind of a weird thing. But also the cloud consumption stuff that they're doing. So, that's really an interesting change. The reason I bring that up is we're going to start to get a better picture of what an apples to apples cloud market looks like. And right now, Amazon has virtually 0% market share in SaaS. So it's, it's, it's an opportunity for them. It's not a threat in any way. Um, it's really an opportunity and so to the extent, I'm really interested in whether or not there's a, I don't want to call it a, 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 a change in strategy, it's an evolution of the strategy, it's a line extension, as you sometimes like to say, into SaaS. And that is, is a multi, multi, tens of billions of dollars of opportunity yeah. for Amazon to do things in vertical. They've started to do some of that with Connect. And, and can Q be that platform on which either Amazon and or its partners build these scalable apps? That could be the Tom Brady. Yeah, I think that's a great analysis, but I'd also say that that's one element of it. They've got the horizontally scalable data layers. What happens with the relationship between data on premise and in the cloud has to be cloud operations. So again, I brought up this up in our session with Rob Strecce. What's the cloud market growth and strategy for AWS? You know, for the adoption to continue, especially when only a small percentage of the IT spend is currently in the cloud. So there's still more growth opportunities that- I don't know about that. What percentage of IT spends in the cloud right now? would you guesstimate? Well, I would say that 30 to 40% of the workloads are in the cloud. What percentage of spend? So, most of the spending. Just guess, throw a dart at the board. I think it's more than the 10% that Andy Jassy says. I'd say it's closer to, closer to 30%. I think that That's map, a big maps number. pretty closely to workloads. Okay, so, then so it's, it's not 50. It's getting there. <laughs> well, exactly, so but, but remember too. But remember too, most of the spending in IT is in services. That's at least half the spending. So if you say IT services is 10 billion, take out half, which is professional services. Now, over time, with AI, you can go after those, that professional services market. No, you no back out services, I think just raw horsepower, that's a smaller percentage. I think there's huge growth in the cloud still. I'm a big bull, I'm long on bull, oh, no, all there's cloud. no question. Well, look at the numbers. Cloud, the, the big three cloud vendors, big four if you want to throw in Alibaba, is growing at you know, 20% a year. On-prem's growing at single digits. Look at Cisco, look at Dell, yeah. look at IBM, look at HPE. My point though, well first of all, <laughs> I'm not disagreeing, I agree, but there's so much growth. Then that, to your point about vertical industries, I think that the industry specific solutions that are going to get more gen AI is critical. Some of the uh, public companies that have data, I just saw, um, Example where ICE, the parent company of NYSE, just randomly noticed that their, their earnings are up big time because of Gen AI on the energy, these regulated sectors. So I think this is going to be like, uh, kind of like a, I won't say a big story, but I think it's a big story where there's going to be this growth in these other markets. 
It's not just general purpose. So I think a, Gen AI is going to have great value in these markets where the retrofitting of pre-existing workloads are going to get immediate value. I think that's where the action is there. So love this vertical market specialization. I think that's going to allow them to set the table for transformational and, and innovation because everyone's looking for the, the shiny new thing. Well, What's the big, you know, big bang um, result of so this is the new thing, like ChatGPT. I think it's more of retrofitting existing. But let me ask you, do you believe in the, in the Gen AI power law that the Cube Research put out yes. know, last year that you obviously helped <laughs> develop? Of course, of course yeah. you believe it. Of course I believe and, it, helped, and helped the, develop it. Isn't the corollary to that that a lot of that is going to occur on-prem? I think in the long tail and in the torso, it's going to be on-prem, and I think as you move up the power law, it's going to be in heterogeneous environments because, look it, let's just be clear. Wait, 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 St stick with this before you go there. If, if that's the case, and then yeah. I'll leave an open question and you can maybe answer it in your response. If that's the case, then it comes down to what is the cloud strategy generally and AWS's strategy specifically for going on-prem? I think you know, uh, Microsoft with Arc you know, and Azure Stack, the old Azure Stack, has a very clear strategy there. Yeah. It's not as clear to me other than Outpost what Amazon has there, but please okay. make your point. All right, so then I'll go back and say why I think they're, what the clear stretch of Amazon is to our mainframe conversation. Yeah. I think the clouds are the mainframe and they're open heterogeneous mainframes. I think if I'm Amazon, I want the data center market to become cloud operations and hybrid and distributed, but ultimately running all the stuff into the power source because they're going to have the GPUs and the silicon, the defense as we say with uh, Belichick, and I think that's their strategy, run through their VC, uh, VPCs and also allow data processing to go wherever it is. And if the customer wants to do data processing on premise for privacy reasons or governance reasons or whatever reasons, Amazon will let that happen. I think it's better to have it develop organically than jam outposts down everyone's throat. Instead, Amazon will shift, and they are shifted to local zones, um, getting better infrastructure. Amazon's core competency is infrastructure as a service. So they're clearly investing all that in there and then making sure they have a robust higher level services platform as a service to make it all work. That's the databases, the data pipelining, and they got work to do there, our, and they're not perfect. Our colo's a threat to that. In other words, if I could take an Equinix, uh, to load up an Equinix data center yeah. with my data, and oh, then I can, co I, can, I, can, I can be proximate to an Amazon cloud. It's kind of yeah. like saying, is Snowflake um, competing against Amazon? It's going to drive more services, again, if you're playing the long game with Jassy and Bezos mindset. Say go for it, yeah. You say let that develop because yep. we're going to get that business. Their Great job point. is to get the business back. So I'd say in the short term, myopic view would be, oh my God, on premise is this problem. Amazon's sticking to, on to Cincinnati, Dave. Yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> so okay, so now the other piece of it that I want to ask you. Hold, uh, on, my, hold on, one more point about the power law because I think the power law, if you don't know what we're talking about, Search the power law of AI, it's on SiliconANGLE and the Cube Research. We basically put out a premise that over a year and a half ago that the, there'd be a power law of AI models. We were right, the specialty models are in the torso, and then proprietary models or, or IP-based data sets are in the tail on premise for companies. That's what everyone's talking about today. Why I'm bringing this up is, let's be clear, the digitization of our world is happening. And you're looking at neural networks coming, you're seeing new kinds of retrieval, Agentic, what you wrote a post on and we've been talking about here in theCUBE and I've been talking about it from a clustered system standpoint is, as things get digitized into data, you now have a whole nother world. That's why I'm big on blockchain and decentralized infrastructure because ultimately, whether it's Bitcoin currency or not, or cloud services, everything will be digitized and digital. That means the, the power will be shift. You'll see commoditization of stuff and the rise of new economics, like agentic systems, and new kinds of data models. So we're going down that road. So the power law will continue to make the play and that's why I think Amazon will be at the top of the, the power law with the, with the big clouds, including Meta and others. And then as you go down, you'll have heterogeneous environments and roles like the data center or Equinix or the hosting providers or the core we's of the world. So you're going to start to see all that. There'll be a lot of bubble bursting, but you know, I see the transformation clearly but at the end of the day, people are just trying to make IT work, Dave. Well, I know. And like, so I can't get CrowdStrike updated on my Windows. When we, um, when we developed the power law, obviously training was that, you know, the steep part of the power law, and, and the long tail was, was inference. And I'm glad you brought up Agentic, because I think a, a big part of that power law, John, is going to be a reformation of the application stack 
and new sets of intelligent data apps that emerge. So I wanted to come back to your Garmin post and ask yeah. you if in fact this sort of came up and specifically in order to enable that, uh, uh, that multiple agents to act yeah. in concert, you've got to have connections to data, particularly back end, even legacy infrastructure or uh, legacy apps. So a key part of that is going to be Amazon or any company's ability to harmonize that data layer. So in other words, today you've got data in a database or a data lake. Amazon, as we all know, has multiple data stores. They've got meta technical metadata and, and operational metadata and business metadata all sort of distributed into the individual services so it's not unified. They've got the ecosystem bringing in governance and so you've got this mishmash of data pipelines which are very brittle and very hard to maintain. You've, you're yeah. calling microservices. That has to change. Yeah. So Amazon, I predict that Amazon at reInvent is going to begin to unveil a unified data strategy that is going to enable those new applications, those intelligent data apps to be built. Did you get any indication from Matt Garman that they're moving in that direction? Well, I tried to poke him on reInvent. Of course, he was tight-lipped. He knew what I was trying to do. Um, but I clearly see that the, there's two things they're going to focus in on at reInvent. Um, I think they're going to go back, stay with their roots of working backwards from the customer, kind of that narrative of onto Cincinnati, when people ask about Gen AI, all the press, everyone's like, what's your, show me progress. They're beavering away, they're pedaling as fast as they can. It's clear to there, but I think they're going to move the needle on two areas. Amazon and the cloud, and Amazon specifically will move the needle in two areas. One, stay in true their bread and butter. Doing the muck work, the undifferentiated heavy lifting. So if you look at Andy Jassy's Q post around coding, it's about code refreshes. It wasn't saying, hey, there'll be, we're going to replace humans. He basically says, we just basically refreshed our platform on Java with, all, with no humans. What he's basically saying is all that shit work was done by agents. So you'll see that classic mundane, you know, undifferentiated heavy lifting. So I think that's phase one. Agents will do that. And then two, I believe this Tom Brady moment is Gen AI, and I think they're going to look at developers, and I think Garmin, what came across with Garmin was is that he, he said, developers are the lifeblood of our business. He didn't say enterprise, he said developers. Now he didn't block the enterprise, but he was using developers as the high order bit in his, in his mind of the value. And, and that applies to enterprises and startups. So I think Garmin was clear that they're going to stay with their roots. He was very Amazonian in his cult-like view. Like, Almost like Jassy, again, Belichick, Parcells. He's going to be good. I think he's going to be, I think he's going to be solid so because he, look, he knows the bread and butter. So I think on reInvent, you're going to see customer examples, their normal stuff, but they got to move the needle on the applications. They got to enable developers to build scalable apps and take advantage of the horsepower that they got with the infrastructure. I mean, working, if they don't do that, then it's just going to be a dud. I mean, working backwards from the customers, in my mind, I've always been very focused on customer pain. What problems can we solve, like today, and what services can we introduce to, sol to solve those problems? So very tactical. I do think some zoom out strategic thinking with customers is necessary here, where customers are saying, look, we're doing all this Gen AI stuff, we're really not getting a big return. It's a big part of that is our data estate is all over the place. You've got to help us you know, bring together our data. And I think that's what they did with, again, it was sort of a tactical hack with zero ETL, right? When they announced that a couple years ago. They did that when they separated compute from storage. It was really kind of a cheering thing. Yeah. But they, they addressed those problems and they come up with you know, solutions that, are, that, that work. And so I'm really interested to see what they do at reInvent in this regard. Like, to use the Tom Brady example, when Tom Brady started, he took over Drew Bledsoe on that injury, famous moment, and Bledsoe never saw another snap. Brady won games. Amazon's got to start winning some games. They got to start putting some real stuff on the scoreboard, real movement on Q, on other things, and if you look at where they have leverage is on their game planning is, I would look at their ecosystem, it's been their core strength, they could really drop a major dime into the ecosystem's hands right now and saying, look at, here's some profit monetization opportunities. That lever could move the needle and Microsoft's vulnerable, especially with the CrowdStrike debacle, that they are an antiquated kind of product compared to Amazon, but they've got a killer ecosystem. 
Microsoft's go-to-market is classic enterprise, and that's always been an Achilles heel for AWS, was how do you crack Microsoft's salesmanship? And the way they got the, the grasp on the customers, Microsoft has that grasp. I mean, shit, they roll out teams. Not that, that was on his chime, which is not, they don't really sell that, but I mean, Microsoft just dictates to customers what to do. And so in the cloud game, that doesn't fly, because cloud breaks, as we saw with CrowdStrike. So, Amazon, Amazon has an opportunity to use that leverage. So put some numbers on the board and then ultimately win the Super Bowl, which is actually continue to be number one. Which by the way, it's not true that Bledsoe never saw another snap. Remember when okay, Brady got did. hurt against Pittsburgh, Bledsoe came in and saved the day. My point is he was a bridge to the future. So the core Amazon IaaS services can be the bridge to that Gen yeah. AI future because they can, they can perform they can continue to, you know, to well, your point, people are running their business on Amazon, so they can continue to generate revenue from that, and, and that can be a Bledsoe-like bridge to continue with the analogy yeah. to the future. Well, well, my point too also was to your thing about you know, Q. You know, if you look at Amazon, one of the things they got criticized in the later part of their growth years was launching and, and abandoning things. So one of the hallmarks of AWS, we've been to all the reinvents except for the original one of small, is that they do a lot of announcements. Was their was their calling card? Look at where all this new announcements, innovation. One of the criticisms has been that they launch and then it gets out there and they don't nurture it. And so, if you look at all the game-changing, needle-moving products from AWS, it's been DynamoDB, it's the database, these key elements. EC2 obviously was the original one, um, part of the key building blocks. Amazon's got to roll out winning product that's going to be as game-changing as DynamoDB, or something like, like if Q, they, they got to make it work. You got to have new building blocks for this Gen AI era. I think that is going to be critical. So one of the things you told me, I'm going to bring it back to VMware, Explore, one of the things you told me is that he brought up Nitro. Garmin brought up Nitro, and we've written about this and researched it, how it's a secret weapon of Amazon. And Many of you might remember Project Monterey. Project Monterey was initiated several years ago and was an ecosystem initiated development by VMware to develop a silicon capability, and again, working with the ecosystem partners to essentially be their Nitro. Nitro is a sort of a virtualization and network interface capability that allows silicon diversity. Um, it has certain security and confidential computing capabilities to allow you to fence off access to the core, um, uh, 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 to, to the center of the core of the, the virtualization engine, and it allows silicon diversity. So we can, we can accept ARM, we can do Intel, we can do AMD, and ultimately, in theory, would set up custom silicon. I haven't heard a, a peep about that project. I think it's dead. Uh, Nitro? No, no, Project Monterey. I, right, which I, is, right, I, okay, I, so, you know, Rockcom probably said, uh, nah. No, we, now, we'll take that on the chip side. Now, maybe, exactly, that's what I was, <laughs> I'm glad you went there, because maybe what's going to happen is the peop, the companies that were going to benefit from that, Dell, HPE, to a certain extent, IBM, Cisco, um, and others, NetApp, Pure, potentially, they'll start working, Broadcom will start working with the Dells of the world or the HPEs of the world to actually develop that capability. I mean, if I were Dell, I would be seriously looking at that because I think that's a gap that they All have right. to, relative from a cost standpoint, relative to the cloud. Now the cloud is expensive for, for many workloads as we know, but from a cost standpoint, that gives the cloud vendors an opportunity and an advantage. AWS has it, Google has it, Microsoft has some you know, similar <laughs> even though they're behind. And so that is a capability that this ecosystem needs. Well, I'm doing a story on this. I'm glad you brought that up and it just ties to the Broadcom chip side. One of the things I asked Garmin was, uh, AI's really hungry for horsepower. Michael Dell had that quote like, you know, AI storage eats up AI, whatever he said. So, but I wanted to bring it back to the supercomputing democratization and this has come up with Charlie Kawaz at Broadcom as well as uh, um, Jensen Wong at NVIDIA. The democratization of supercomputing is happening. Garmin did agree with that, but I wanted to ask him, if I'm developers, are there ecosystems developing on top of the hardware? And are people writing to the kernel level? You know what he said? Absolutely. He validated my statement. Our thesis on theCUBE, again, another CUBE first, you're seeing software developers coming down to the hardware, okay? So then I asked him about this trend. He goes, 
And he could put up the nitro control. He goes, you remember, that I'm going to quote him directly here, Dave. I actually have the quote. Actually, if you remember, our first chip that we delivered was actually the nitro controller and thinking about the whole nitro set. So it wasn't even a, a viable customer chip. It was a chip for the system. And we quickly, long ago, more than a decade, realized we first had the Annapurna team come join us. We realized building custom silicon in order to build custom network and hypervisor virtualization layer was incredibly important over a decade ago. And that's how we get line rate networking. It's how we get better performance and storage. We virtualize all those into our Nitro system. Much better performance, super interesting, and that's how it's become a security layer because they can do stuff at line rate. That was the key. It was just a small little chip for the system and the Annapurna team, you said one of the best acquisitions ever in the it industry. It was a $350 million acquisition. It was I mean, super. It's up there with VMware and, and EMC. It's up there, it's <laughs> one of the most strategic, genius moves, but that actually generated that hypervisor virtualization layer integrating into the chip level, and then he went on and on. Then he actually, he basically <laughs> trashed Infiniban. Uh, what do you say about Infiniban? <laughs> 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 Some need the most bandwidth, lowest latency, and those between nodes, and things like InfiniBand, which is quite popular. Some of the other clouds kind of gloomed onto it using InfiniBand. But the problems of InfiniBand, it doesn't scale at the rate you need. Yeah. Quote, InfiniBand doesn't scale at the rate you need. Matt Garman, CEO of Amazon Web Services and said that's that. Why it's very fragile, it's expensive, it's not like, so long ago we invested into networking that was Ethernet. And, and that's why. There it is. And that's why, by the way, you know, Broadcom's all over Ethernet yeah. with the Ultra Ethernet uh, consortium. And by the way, Nvidia is also doing Ethernet. So Nvidia is bringing the CUDA stack and its software expertise to e to Ethernet. So they're not. They, they understand that problem. You remember at GTC this year, Jensen basically described what they had to do: these unnatural acts to get NV Link working with Blackwell and these clusters. And so, yeah. it's it's something that, uh, as an industry trend, I mean, Ethernet is. So is, is here's the quote on this. Unstoppable. Here's the quote on Ethernet. They're going to need reliability and, oper op and be operable. And Finiband just doesn't have those characteristics. Ethernet, we saw there was work to do. We made huge investment. We invested over the last decade. We get better performance out of our Ethernet, network, Ethernet networks than you can on large Infiniband network. And those investments have things like EFA and our own protocols to help us get low latency, high throughput performance that customers need inside the cloud world. This is huge endorsement. I think, that's, I think that's probably true at distance. I'm not so sure it's, it's true at very short distances. Yeah, I mean, I think InfiniBand is, a, and I've always said, if, you, if you're close, but it's not, a, it's not your silver bullet. Ethernet is open, it's standard. You know, you know how I feel about that, but I just thought that was interesting that Garmin went in the weeds. I mean, I like this guy. You know why I like Matt Garmin? He's a helicopter. He can go high level and go low level. He can sit with product guys and talk about engineering and then sit in a boardroom and talk about digital transformation. So, you know, I'm, a, I'm long on Amazon as, as I am with Microsoft, but I think Microsoft's got the, some challenges. All good, Dave, all good. So the big, big th thing everybody's waiting for this week, John, is NVIDIA earnings. NVIDIA and CrowdStrike both announced on Wednesday. You know, NVIDIA, NVIDIA's up. Like, remember it crashed you know, a month ago, it's up like 30% in the last three weeks, right? I mean, people, people are piling back in. I mean, it's kind of gone sideways for a while. Maybe it's kind of recoiling for either to go up or down, but that's going to be the big news this week. Everybody's watching NVIDIA. They're watching the demand picture. Are they going to make statements around Blackwell availability? Um, you know, you know we, we debated this on the Cube pod a while ago. You were talking about the, the pop in the bubble, if you will. I still think demand because of the CapEx spend, still outstrips supply. You see, there was an article in the Wall Street Journal today about a, a, a reach around, the Chinese companies are doing a reach around to get H100s, you mentioned that up front. But I, st I think, look, NVIDIA, we forecast that NVIDIA is going to be you know, well over a $150 billion revenue company by 2028. If you look at the forecast for NVIDIA, they're growing, revenue is doubling in 2024, up 40% in 2025, you know, going down to 15% in 2026. I think they're going to potentially beat those numbers. I think they could potentially, John, be a $200 billion company, you know, as we enter the end of this decade. And so, I still like the NVIDIA thesis, the long-term thesis. 
I know everybody's coming after him. I know there's a lot of talk about inference, but to your point, training and inference go together. I think Infra, uh, NVIDIA has a lead that is maybe not insurmountable, but I think it's sustainable for at least five, potentially 10 years. You know, when you see companies like this, that you say, oh, that's too overpriced, it's got, it's way overvalued. Every single successful company, you go back 30 years, Microsoft in the 80s, oh, that's too high, can't get any higher than that. You know, um, Facebook, can never get any higher than that. Google, all the top high-flying companies. The only thing that could hurt NVIDIA is themselves, and I think right now, I believe their lead is, is huge. I think the mode is software. They're still a chip company, they still price by the chip, but their value is software. So as long as there's no major, quote, world event, force majeure, something bad happens to NVIDIA, things blow up, allocation happens on the hardware side, they got this. Now the question on competition is going to be, can they ramp up? So that assumes that NVIDIA is staying still. And this is what I tell everybody, yes, NVIDIA is not standing still, they're investing, and I think that Jensen's so smart, he gamed this, he only went public knowing he has stuff in his back pocket coming. So if Blackwell drags on and CUDA doesn't really deliver, or the customers aren't ready, that's the only thing that could hurt them. Uh, and I think, you know, it's, I, I'm not a stock market buyer, so like, I always like cringe, oh, I can't go higher. It just seems like, oh my God, it's just like, they're going to do a stock split and it's going to be back up to 1,000 again? Oh, Dave, that's what, how many trillion dollar market cap is that at well, that they're point? Well, they're up over three trillion. They're, they're, they're banging the door at 3.2 trillion now, so, you know, what's next? Yeah. Four, I mean, then five. I mean, I, I know and, it's. You know, Silicon Valley's going to be littered with NVIDIA millionaires now. Um, and that's going to replace the Facebook millionaires, it replaced the Google millionaires. So, you know, another Silicon Valley um, trillion dollar baby, Dave. You know, it's just what, it happens. So it's like, don't even think about buying a house in Palo Alto. You see the, <laughs> you see the article, there was an article in the Wall Street Journal, I think it was this weekend or last week, about um, all these investors, these, these Main Street investors who put their money into NVIDIA, and the, 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 there was an orthodontist, who's obviously you know, pretty wealthy, does well. He bought the stock, he, he put in like 60 grand, 50 or 60 grand in 1999. And he now owns uh, $15 million worth of NVIDIA stock. He has never sold. <laughs> so. NVIDIA since 1919, 19, 2019 I should say, since 2019 jumped 3,776%, okay? Current, this is a headline on Bloomberg. Current and former NVIDIA staff say that despite the 3,776% stock jump since Minting many millionaires, the hours are just as grueling and high stress. Now remember Jensen said in that Stanford talk, basically what he said, you got to have a face plan, you got to fail. He's like, look at, I mean, Jensen, he, he works, he's a work, workhorse. He's like a tech, he's like the Wayne Gretzky of, of tech. He's just a legend. So, you know, they're not resting on their laurels, to my point. You know, I think the catch up of the competition is just as important as watching NVIDIA's ability to execute continually. So it's like, uh, you're a horse racer, remember Secretariat? Of course. Once it had the lead, no one ever caught it. You know, so once it got from behind, like NVIDIA did, I think the question is, competition question is, how fast can they catch up to them and what do they gain? And how fast can NVIDIA not so, gain? So just by comparison, so just, doing some searching, and I'm not sure these numbers are exact, but the, according to Perplexity and Google, um, NVIDIA's P, forward PE ratio is in the 70s today, and Cisco, at the height of its PE during the dot-com was 472 price to earnings ratio. So it's, you know, people often like to compare the dot-com to the current situation. I've written about this. There are many similarities, don't get me wrong, but that's not one of them, right? So, one could argue, well, wow, maybe NVIDIA is not overvalued. Maybe it's actually relatively cheap. If they're going to blow through these numbers, if they're going to be a $200 billion revenue company that's going to throw off, maybe their gross margins will moderate a little bit, but they're, they're still, if they're, if they're getting 60, 65, 70% gross margin, that might be um, an undervalued stock, John, right? I, I, again, I'm digging, I've been digging into this because I want to know. You know, I've been trying to crack this puzzle. Is NVIDIA overvalued or not? And, you know, I have, 
I'm like the two-armed lawyer on one hand, and then on the other hand. So it's, <laughs> you know, there's so much going on around it. You know, this it's just incredible. So I mean, I just first of all, I love the market. Now, where I think Nvidia could shoot themselves in the foot if you had to pick one area is overextending where they don't have leverage. That's why I like the HPE deal, but the leverage there is, is that if the HPE sales force can't handle NVIDIA sales, are they trained? Or is the HPE channel and sales force trained up? Again, it's like playing Major League Baseball. Are you, can they handle it, Dave? So I think they could, but NVIDIA's banking on that. And I'm not, and I love NVLink for NVIDIA. I'm not sold on the NIMS, because I think RAG is popular now, but the agent post that you wrote, the agentic post points out that there's life behind RAG. And again, two killer apps in my mind right now for AI is retrieval augmentation generation, which is vector embed, neural network format, and ultimately agentic services. Let me ask you a question. So, so the, the forward PE ratio on NVIDIA is now about low 40s. And the average, the, the average PE ratio for companies in the NASDAQ is about 25. So is, is in, in your mind, given the TAM, given its market leadership, given its technology investments, given its leadership, sh is it justifiable that NVIDIA, sh is forward PE ratio should be under 2X the average of NASDAQ? I would say absolutely, because if you think about Intel and Microsoft during its monopoly days, and I think NVIDIA has a form of monopoly, um, they were able to command a much more significant premium. I don't know exactly what it was, but I bet you it was like four or five X over the average uh, NASDAQ stock because of their market position, because they're essentially their monopoly power. And I think it's hard to say that, uh, hard to argue, NVIDIA doesn't have a monopoly right now. If you want the chips, you want the, the latest and greatest, you got to go to NVIDIA. NVIDIA owns the market right now. They have a default monopoly by having the better product. And we are in a product-led growth market right now. And if you look at all the companies that we cover, whether it's IBM, HPE, Dell, Oracle, all the way across the gamut of cloud, up and down the power law, whatever you want to do, if you do not have a product-led strategy in this market transition, in my opinion, you're toast. Okay, I'll repeat that again. If you're in this market and you don't have a product-led winner that's transformative, you're toast. You're a me too player. Again, there's two sides of history here. Which side of the street will you be on? And ultimately, this is where it's going on. And a lot of everyone's focused on this and it's trickling down into the trenches, Dave. The platform wow. engineers, the database guys. If you look at the entire stack, hardware, middleware, apps, just to oversimplify it, every single part of the stack is in going through change. Every theater, business tech is under siege with change. And so, it's opportunity. The other killer business model out there that, that we haven't talked about um, in the context of silicon and hardware is Broadcom. They're not competing head on with NVIDIA in GPUs, but they are competing in terms of being the interconnectivity you know, layer. Yeah. So there's only a couple of companies in the world who can both do like uh, 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 networking on the chip you know, and networking at distance. And that's NVIDIA and that's Broadcom, right? And so Broadcom, because of its strategy from a silicon standpoint, of betting on connect centricity, we heard this from Charlie uh, Kawas in, in, in our interviews with him, um, that is a, a form of monopoly in that they've locked up the market for the best silicon that connects all this stuff. And they've got, they've got Google, they've got Meta, and they've got ByteDance as long-term customers. That, so they are, we've, we've got, yeah. you know, Floyer and I, we've got Broadcom, you know, at going, blowing through 50 billion you know, this decade, you know, being a 55 to $60 billion revenue company, um, that's just in silicon. That doesn't include yeah. the VMware piece. I think the, the VMware is a, is a cyclical thing that they can hedge. You got to get their act together, fix this quickly, get this revenue back up and, and durable and stable. But I will tell you that like the power law, again, go back to the power law, you're going to have GPU and connectivity challenges around the new custom silicon, the kind of horsepower that power supercomputing. But here's the thing. The Dells of the world who have the AI factory, Michael Dell's vision is beautiful because what's happening is you got to have the power law on size of device. And when you look at um, Matt Garman's my interview with him, he, he says some things about inference. You have to have devices that have hardware that's performant based on the form factor and power it draws. So 
So you have the big data centers, they're going to have mega power, and then you're going to see that get spread out distributedly across that power law, where you're going to have the size of the diet the footprints. So if you got a little camera, you're doing inference, you're not going to do a lot of training there, you're going to send that back for training, or maybe co-locate it somehow, so the data strategy is going to be different. And so you see a completely different architecture for that. Now, the AI, I'm a big believer in the AI PC is the right direction because all hardware has got to be refactored to be compute. So I think, I think compute's going to be massively big opportunity or XPU or a combination of PUs, like GPU, CPU, um, FPGNA. I think you're going to see processing you're units. going to see a whole systems architecture that was once a motherboard exercise happen into, into the computing realm. And again, um, when I talk about um, inference, this happened with Garmin. He brought it up and says, he says to me, quote, why, why would you want to have all that training done and not have inference, right? So he says inference is going to be huge. Well, I mean, that's the point of the training. So you can do inference. By the way, Dell also reports uh, this week on Thursday. Some of the things you should look for at Dell, you mentioned AI PCs. People want to see evidence of AI PC, that at least getting some traction or it's got, it, it starts to hit the, the monetization, become a meaningful portion of, the, of Dell's forward guidance, we'll see. But the big thing that people are looking for from Dell is in AI servers. Remember last quarter, their AI, their, their server business uh, grew, and I, I might be off here, it might be AI servers or servers, but the growth was like 42% year on year. But the problem was that profits were flat. So imagine that, John, they grew, you grow revenue 40 plus percent and your operating profit is flat, okay? <laughs> so the stock tanked when people heard, saw that. They said, oh my God, Dell's not going to make money in AI servers, and Dell sort of messaged, look, we're, right now we're winning market share, we're, we're, we're selling um, at good prices to seed the base with our partners in, 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 in MSPs in particular, but going forward when we start selling to enterprises, the margin's going to improve because they're going to be more onesie twosie. We'll see. The second thing I'm looking for there is what's happening in storage. Dell has been a shared donor in storage and that is against their, their business model of gaining share you know, on a consistent basis. And so they've been doning share, uh, donating share and so We'll be looking for those two things. The other companies I'd love to talk about at some point is CrowdStrike announcing on Wednesday. Yeah, I mean, I think we, we're kind of running out of time here, but I want to quickly say that I'm not sure HP has the PC AI. I haven't heard anything from them um, on the AI PC. Well, they, yeah, they've, you know, they've, they've announced something there, right? So, I mean, it's like they're hiding the ball. Uh, I think Dell is much more focused, even with the layoffs, I think they're going to go all in on AI. I think, you know, Dell's one of those companies that transformed. You brought this up on a queue. We had a big debate about this. Internet, they transition. Yeah, yeah. Michael Dell has a good eye for market transitions. We always say you win on transitions. They effectively transit from mail order to the internet and web. Web to cloud. And now cloud to AI, and I think they will lay off their employees and do that and get it done and they'll come back stronger. So layoff is I mean, again, we debated about this, but to me the layoff was a Jack Welch move. You know, let's. Yeah, it's a lot of people. Just, you know, let's just pay. We got, we got too many people. We're going we're gonna to yeah. be more efficient. We're, we're going to reorganize. Um, we're going to drive AI into our business and automation, and yeah. Yeah, we can cut and 10% and, and make drive. the transition. Yeah, absolutely. Versus I mean, go out of business, slow death. Yeah, or, or you know, hang on to folks that aren't top. Yeah. 50%, you know, well, let's get into 90%. the, let's, we have a couple minutes left. Give us your take on, on the CrowdStrike and then the M&A stuff. So CrowdStrike, the action in CrowdStrike stock has been really interesting. I mean, I got some data here, some, they, they peaked in July at around three, the stock price at 398. It dropped down on August 2nd to 217. So that's a 45% drop roughly. Now it's a 268, so it's up about 23% in the last, you know, since August 2nd. So this month it's done very well. I love CrowdStrike. Uh, I mean, I have great respect for the company. They got a great product. Their, their CEO, George Kurtz, is a baller. Having said all that, the, the, the problem that they had occurred in July, John, and the, the, the biggest selling month of your quarter is the last quarter of the month. So obviously that hurt them. We heard Nikesh Arora uh, at their, in their quarter said, we had to scramble to keep our quarter intact because of all the CrowdStrike distraction. Many of our customers were dealing with you know, the blue screen of death. So we, <laughs> it was, 
we had to work hard to get their attention and close business in our quarter. I know Palo Alto had a great quarter, so they're clearly back on track. What I think is going to happen, I think George Kurtz is going to reset the quarter. I think I've, the last quarter was, everybody knows, it's going to, not going to be a good quarter. So that's why the stock dropped. The big question is, what's the guidance going to look like? Of course, that sounds like bromide, but I think George Kurtz is going to use this opportunity to say, look, we're still working through this. We are going to reset our ARR targets way down. He's going to dial them down. I think people are going to freak out and say, okay, that's going to drive earnings down, and they're going to reset. So, um, so I think that's going to happen. I think they've still got this overhang of people are going to sue them. They're going to, the ETR data that just came out, cl very clearly customers are still in negotiation. They're giving discounts. They're trying to you know, get renewals at a, at a better price. And they're still negotiating on, is there any compensation involved? We know Delta Airlines is going to you know, try to get a pound of flesh. So all that is going to cause, I think, a CrowdStrike reset so I think you got to wait for that and maybe look yeah. for opportunities to jump in you know, after that. I would not be, <laughs> I'd be, I think it's a very dangerous game to be buying ahead of earnings generally, yeah. uh, but especially here. It's very tough to predict. You know, I don't like to do that. I know some traders that like to buy ahead of earnings, like I'm going to try to get in now. I think it's really hard to I predict mean, right now in this like market transition. They say, as they say, it's trying to catch a falling knife. You don't know it's going to be falling or whatever. I think they're going to reset. I mean, they're going to have to take their medicine. Yeah. And, and I think their product leadership is just too good, and they don't go away. I don't, and same with Microsoft, like even though the blue screen of death, which was, you know, that's from the 90s. You know, 30 years ago was the launch of Windows 95. There are still Windows 95 machines powering some manufacturing lines. Why, because the app works on it. I shouldn't say that, Windows workers maybe, but that's still a few years later. My point is, if you're running your business on Windows, you risk the Delta Airlines situation. So I think, People are looking at their system saying, if Microsoft can't be a core system where Linux and other more hardened open standards work, I'm not saying Microsoft's going to go away, I'm just saying Windows shouldn't be, it's not designed to be running you know, an airline. A lot of people are running their business on Windows though, right? I'm just so. saying, Windows is not run, melt, built to run an airline, as you can see from CrowdStrike. I mean, CrowdStrike fucked up, I, letting it go, they, Oh, they own that, but they also point out the fact that on the Microsoft side, it was a house of cards. Well, Nikesh. So, so that means you can't run your business on Microsoft. But, well, That's the takeaway. It's, it's, it's a combination of Microsoft and CrowdStrike. Nikesh Aurora again dealt, dealt with this. He said, look, first of all, he was very respectful. He said, this is not a good thing for the industry, so we're not going to, they're not going to ambulance chase, so I, I respect that. Uh, he was, I mean, they compete with CrowdStrike, um, sometimes you know, very vehemently. But basically he said, look, we do things differently. When we roll stuff out, we roll it out to a small 1%, and then we go from there. I know, but I'm but, not. But, but CrowdStrike has a different philosophy. CrowdStrike's like, we got to go fast. We got to yeah, because, update, because, update yeah, faster. Because, They're be, doing their job. Because, exactly, because the, the, the adversary is fast. So if we roll out 1%, the adversary sees where the holes are, they're going to attack. So their, uh, CrowdStrike's philosophy is speed, speed, speed. And you know, look, this time it bit them in the ass. Um, but I, I, it's going to be interesting. I'm going to ask George Kurtz at CrowdStrike. Yeah. You know, are you going to change your rollout strategy? How are you going to how are you going to change that? And yeah, I'm also going to ask him if anybody got fired. Yeah, but they're at risk of the. And you're saying it's Microsoft's no, has to I'm take not, no, some I mean, of the blame. No, here. I think that your line of question should be right. I mean, I would I, the question I would say to him is that he's at the at the will of the market. And the market is what the existing current situation is. The current situation is people are running their business on Windows. Now, I'm, people say to me, John, why are you so anti-Microsoft? I'm not anti. I love Microsoft. Grew up on the whole. I grew up on the Microsoft generation. I just think that and, oh, you're pro Amazon. Yeah, they're like hundred times better than Microsoft at what they do. What? Cloud, cloud, yeah. scale, and so Linux is. 10 times better than Windows and running shit. So like, if you, and what I am pro on is, when you're re-architecting your enterprise, Microsoft was serving IT from the old generation. So you have this sprawl of all this IT with Windows, and it's just not built for that generation, this new generation. It's, some of it's not multi-threading, it's not fully architected. So we are moving into a world where, as Garmin points out, these things are integrated down to the the high line speed optimization now at full scale. That's not Windows. So I think CrowdStrike was doing their job and they realized that Delta grew to re a Windows shop. And guess what? When shit happens, you're out of business. 
Well, they were doing their so, job. So but, but nobody wants that, by the way. So that's my point. If, if I'm in an enterprise and, and, I, and, and I'm not asking the question to my team, what does our platform look like for the next 10 to 20 years? If the answer is Microsoft, I'd probably like, I want to look under the hood. Well, like, like really? You know what was fascinating like, to me, John? Like show me the architecture that pens that together. Uh, I, will, I, I would be, I, if someone could show me how Windows is going to power an a business, a multinational global company at scale, versus say Linux, you know, fully managed, distributed computing, hard, like big iron-like stuff. And that's that's what that's why the mainframe argument's a good one coming back. So I'm just skeptical that that could happen. So that's why I like Amazon. I think Amazon, for all their good and bad, are high-scale supercomputing capability. So ETR did a survey in July. They did it the day the the problem occurred, the incident occurred. And of course, it was a big emotional backlash. They just did another one that just closed, uh, just just this uh, late last week. And look, the the reality is, it, it's not easy to move off a of CrowdStrike. You know, yeah. people people they have this emotional response, but people are still considering. They're de there's no question yeah. they're changing their sort of thinking around this. But here's what's interesting: which of the following vendors have you evaluated as a possible alternative to CrowdStrike? Number one was Microsoft. And I'm like, whoa, wait a minute. Yeah, because they're, it's hard to get off Microsoft too. <laughs> yeah, but if that, yeah, but okay, but you're going to move from CrowdStrike to Microsoft, where Microsoft was part of the problem, and you're going to migrate to Microsoft? Well, so that, Mi Microsoft's, argument was, Microsoft's argument is that we'll have better, tighter integration. So I, I think Microsoft will win on this. Again, it's just as hard to move off Microsoft. Yeah, but, yeah, security's not as good. I mean, it's, so it's, I mean, not, it's, just, it's a good enough approach. Well, I would but, argue but, that. But behind that was Sentinel-1, then Fortinet, then Palo Alto, all about the same and then so forth, Cisco, Tanium. But the fact that Microsoft was number one, I mean, to me, that was a, a major call out. Now this is, again, a small survey. It's only a, an N of 100, um, but still, I mean, I, I, that would not be my first choice, John. Uh, I mean. I mean, look at, like, you, like the survey says, it's hard to move off CrowdStrike. This is the problem you have to have when companies rely on the vendors. When you have the switching costs that have dramatic and uh, grave consequences of moving disruption. It's hard to switch. So CrowdStrike alone is well, a good product. The switching costs are so high. Microsoft is even worse. They're so nested into these enterprises, you just can't just rip it out. You can't just turn a switch and replace it with so, Linux. So 40% of the respondents said they've evaluated alternatives in the last 30 days. But only 17% said, yeah, but we were doing that anyway. 23% said we, we've evaluated alternatives in response to the outages. So 60% said no, we haven't. Now maybe they've been too busy. But so, I feel like CrowdStrike's pretty sticky. I think it's a leading product. And yeah, they, they messed up. And so, I'm really curious as to, I mean right now they're being very transparent about what happened. And they're negotiating with customers about what they're going to do about it. What I'm trying to understand is, okay, going forward, how is this never going to happen again? Yeah, and I think your point about the resetting earnings, this is a really good, interesting point you brought up because I think that's smart because we had the, what happened to CrowdStrike, but I mean, I see massive growth coming with Gen AI, but what I don't know is what the consequence will be for the folks who are on the growth side. Like I said, look at some of the companies going out of business. You're seeing, there's already kind of talk of AI bubble bursting. People can't meet those revenue numbers. And so, in every bubble, the question is, does it pop or the bubble get air out of it slowly? And I think, to me, Definitely this huge growth, but will there be consolidation before this massive inflection kick up to the growth side? So, you know, constantly evaluating the market right now, and I think the M&A market will tell us more. Well, and that's why I'm so anti-Lena Khan, because, you know, there has to be robust consolidation for exit and liquidity to feed the system. And only that, just get through the bubble and get to reality, because in every bubble, whether it's a dot-com, web 2.0, everything that was in the bubble actually happens. So well, it's just, you so know, people couple, get too excited. Couple things there, one is, we heard Liz Warren say, thank God for Lena Khan, we need to give her more power. I don't agree with that. Um, I, think, I think three letter agencies um, have plenty of power, my view. Um, and in terms of the bubble bursting, you know, the question is, okay, will it be a buying opportunity for people? Uh, I think, yes, it will be, because you have extremely profitable companies, cloud companies, and companies like NVIDIA and Broadcom, if and when the bubble bursts, and it will, 
to me, those are outstanding buying opportunities, probably better than was in the dot com, which was very unclear who was going to make it through. And so, so, <laughs> so. Well, it was when they weren't making any money, but. Right, well, right, but none of them were making any money at the time, whereas today they are. So maybe the, maybe the bubble will be a soft, <laughs> a soft burst, a soft landing for the bubble. But I mean, it's, to me, it's not like a Cloudera situation where Cloudera, awesome company, they started the big data, but their business model was never like a monopoly-like business model, like, a, like an NVIDIA or a Broadcom is. And so that, you know, even though they got it all started and they were the source of innovation for today's big data era, they weren't able to get through the knot hole. And now they're you know, a good company, but not the great company that they you know, potentially could be. Well, Snowflake, you look at Snowflake, right? That was the hottest company on the planet. And now, you know, the LinkedIn post that we're on this weekend, where uh, one of the VCs, one of your contacts put out, hey, you know, they, they messed up. They missed buying DBT or Fivetran. They missed getting through that knot hole. And now they're, you know, they've got some real challenges. That was an epic LinkedIn thread um, yeah. that you shared. I mean, I think it's a whole world. Um, just as we end this special Cube pod here at the VMworld, uh, I just want to let you know, I got a comment on my LinkedIn. So following this analogy, does that make Adam Selesky Pete Carroll of AWS? If so, should we watch where he turns up next, could win the next Super Bowl? <laughs> he got it right away. Oh, Garmin even commented on there. All right, looks like it's uh, the, the football analogy resonated with the sports fans. Obviously, I couldn't resist the NFL example because of Thursday Night Football, so. Um, Dave, always great analysis. Again, this is a Cube Pod special analysis deep dive in the industry right now. A lot going on around Broadcom VMware, a lot going on in the cloud. Again, the relationship between the cloud and on-premise and edge is driving a lot of innovation and a lot of kind of calibration of all the existing stuff out there to prepare for this big wave. A lot of stuff going on at the hardware level, at the data level, and VMware is right in the middle. And so are we here on theCUBE, getting all the data, share that with you, putting it into our neural network. We'll be back with more live coverage after this short break. <laughs>